Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the American Masterminds Podcast. Each episode, we invite extraordinary guests who are masters of their craft, they're innovators, entrepreneurs, and of course, motorcycle enthusiasts who have made their mark in the world. They share their stories, insights, and hard-earned wisdom, giving you a front row seat to the strategies and experiences that shape their successes. So sit back, grab a drink, and get ready for an exhilarating ride as we dive deep into the minds of these exceptional individuals. Along the way, we'll uncover powerful strategies, gain fresh perspectives, and explore the limitless possibilities of what it takes to be an American mastermind. That too. I'm Destiny Garcia. I'm the executive director of Clean Slate Utah. I'm also somebody who's been formally incarcerated. I've gone through the expungement process twice, um, and that's why this line of work is so important to me. My name is Charlotte Waterbury, and I am Destiny's Intake Coordinator. Um, I have also experienced having a criminal history, and I am currently going through my own expungement. Very nice. Very nice. So what is then, give, give us kind of a summary or, or a, a overview, broad overview of Clean Slate Utah. It's easier to start with the Clean Slate Law. So okay. the, in Utah, Utah was the second state in the nation to pass the Clean Slate legislation. And what that is is that the, it shifts the burden from the individual to the government and they will automatically expunge certain misdemeanor records. Okay, interesting. So in that is class A drug possession, most misdemeanor Bs and Cs, and all infractions. Okay. It's a great law, it's gonna help over 534,000 people, but the problem with it is there's no direct notification requirements. Oh, so people who are able to be expunged don't know. They they will never be notified of it. So that's what Clean Slate Utah was formed for, was to raise awareness around this law Mm -hmm. and then to also help people who may not fit in that criteria that may have to go through a petition-based expungement for different types of charges, like different misdemeanors, felonies, things like that that don't fit in that bucket. Right. Um, And then also to help with pardon support as well. Nice. So out out of my own personal curiosity, the, the Clean Slate law that you're talking about, you're saying that that law is just going to automatically expunge all of these different charges. So and the problem is that these people just don't know that their charges are expunged. Right. So yeah. they still have to meet. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> we'll talk over each other. They still have to meet the criteria of what an expungement, the expungement criteria, right? So they still have gotcha. to fit in that bucket of charges. So right. you can't have more than like uh, two class A misdemeanors, more than four class B misdemeanors. So you still have to fit in the bucket to get an expungement. And a lot of people we deal with do not fit in that bucket. So we help them with the court-based process as well. Gotcha. The biggest problem we saw with the the bucket of automatic clearance charges is that now people are in the middle of the process. They can't find the charge. Did it get automatically expunged? Is it just not digitized? So now we're having to play this, this game of Sherlock where is it just that we can't find the record online? Has it been expunged? And then we need proof of the expungement. Whenever you do anything legal, you need documents of that you need to retain everything right so we're going back through and trying to track down the charge if it hasn't been expunged what process do they need to go through to get to that point because the government has been the law's been rolling out really slowly so they've only cleared about 10 to 15 percent of those records so far Uh, so they still have a lot more to go gotcha when did this law go into effect it was implemented february 10th of 2022 oh so very new it passed in 2019 but then COVID hit us all Mm. and everything was shut down so utah was the second state in the nation there's now 12 states that have this law wow Uh, new york is the most recent one huh interesting yeah so for the viewers that may not know walk us through why somebody would want an expungement So the biggest factor in having a criminal record is when you go to get housing employment, you essentially have to explain your life, right? You have a charge from when you were 18 years old. You have to now disclose everything that you've been in the past, where you were, why you got this charge, um, even if you're a completely different person, right? Right. My criminal history is from, from many years ago and I still have to give kind of a disclaimer, right? Hey, this is my past, this is who I am now, um, and hope that people will look past that. when you get it expunged, it's almost like a new lease on life. You no longer have to disclose that you've had a criminal history. You can make more money. You can get better housing opportunities. Within the first year of someone having their record expunged, they make, what, 20% more oh, wow. on their income. So it opens up massive opportunities. Not only that, but if you go back to school, <laughs> when you go to get your master's, you have to talk about this. You have to go through all of your charges 
to further your education, which is just frustrating and really embarrassing. You have to, you have to disclose charges to get a, ma uh, to get into a master's program. Do when you graduate, to get your double licensing, your oh. department of, department of professional licensing. Right. If you have a criminal record, you have to sit down and explain each and every charge to them in order to get that license. Wow. Which a lot of people in our community are recovering from substance misuse disorder and they're going to be social workers or counselors to work in that field and they all have criminal records. Right. I mean that makes a, a lot barrier. of sense, right? Mm -hmm. You got these people who this is this is like a passion mm -hmm. of theirs because it's so heavily impacted their own life. And now you're saying, Hey, we're gonna put up a bunch of roadblocks and make this really difficult for you to participate yeah. in this and make this better. And huh. not only that, but explain explain yourself, right? Like there's a lot of decisions we make when we're younger or if we've suffered from an addiction, you make a lot of choices you're not super proud of. Right. And now you have to explain that 10, 15, 20 years later and it's just not, I mean, for me, it's just not fair. You're a totally different person. It doesn't matter what qualifications you have, you still have to disclose this information and hope and pray that you can get past HR or get past the hiring and actually get to a job that you know you're qualified for. Hmm. So you're saying, you know, I'm a totally different person. When I, your vast clientele, are you talking about somebody that they did something when they were younger and now they've gone, gone through the system and grown up a little bit? Is that kind of your typical clientele? We have a variety of different people. We have people that um, have been crime-free for 20, 30 years. They just lost their job because of COVID and now they're trying to get a new job and they can't mm. because of their criminal record. Right. We have people that are fresh in recovery and are still in a waiting period and we're trying to help them get them to the end of that waiting period. Gotcha. We have lots of single moms, dads, people working two and three jobs to support their families because they can't get one decent job. Hmm. So do you provide like additional resources, it sounds like, mm -hmm. as well? So like for the people that are on the waiting or in the waiting period, so to speak, like those people, you'd be providing additional resources or trying to connect them to the right resources. Yeah. We always want to really have cool. them this is what we say we want to keep you at a clean slate until you qualify uh -huh. so what resources are you struggling with now that you may need to keep you on the right path so that when your waiting period is over we can apply for that expungement right i think one of the really wonderful things about my job is that i get to screen people right so individuals that are looking into this um and it, it usually is people who are in recovery who have changed their life i am an individual in recovery so the people that come through are saying, hey, I've cleaned up my life. This is the last thing hanging over my head. Um, and that's super empowering because if you can get away from that, a whole world of opportunity has now opened. But I've also had individuals come through that had a charge from the 80s. That is, they're trying to go serve a mission in another country and they can't because of this charge. Um, I've actually been really surprised by the full gamut of people mm -hmm. that have come through because you would never guess. Right. Um, and it one in four Utahns has a criminal history. Yep. So we see everybody. Um, and it's it's really important to keep an open mind and not really take a look at the charge and just help people as people. Because a lot of times people end up with charges that have no bearing on who they are as a person or what they were even doing. Unfortunately, our justice system is a little broken. We're a yes. lot broken. Yes. I am not a representative, but I do work for the Department of Corrections, uh, which I, so I, I see that, and, and, and I see that in a big way, too. I, I, I empathize with the same problems that you guys deal with because on the Department of Corrections side, we don't have any bearing over what the courts have done. We don't have any bearing over, you know, from, from point A to point B, when they have their first interaction with a law enforcement officer, something goes wrong. Now they're in the justice system. Now they're going through the court system. Now they've got this, the sentence, they're going to prison. That's the only, that's where we come in, right? And so there's all of this stuff that has happened beforehand and, and it, it makes our job really difficult. And so I'm sure in the same light, it makes your job really difficult. Mm -hmm. Not only do you have all of these different roadblocks being put up by state agencies or seemingly so, whether it be intentional or just right. because of bureaucracy and red tape and all that sort of goodness. Uh, yeah, it, that, I, it's, a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle individually, and I, I definitely appreciate that you guys are able to kind of bring that into an organizational structure and help these people with it, because it, it is not an easy thing to deal with, the right. justice system. It's also a really long process, right? Even once you know what path you need to take, it, it's a journey. Um, yeah. Every court is different. Every police department is different. So you're jumping through different hoops for every, every organization that you work with. Um, to get your police reports, to file your dockets with your court. Um, every court is different. Every court clerk is different. Um, so that, that presents another barrier, and it, you need a lot of patience to get through it. And our goal and our hope is that 
by having a resource and someone they can call and, and get support, ask questions, they're going to make it further through that process. Right. And we have now been starting to get results as well, which is incredible. In the past, something like 80% of people who started the expungement process did not complete it. Right. Um, we're now to a place with our organization that we are getting people reaching out saying, hey, I got all my stuff expunged. And that's incredibly exciting for, for mm -hmm. me as someone who has helped support them, yeah. but also for our state, for our economy, for everything, it's a really big deal. Yeah. I and mean, expungement is good for everything. Yeah, it's good, it's good for, for everyone. Families. It's a win-win-win, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. It's good for our economy. It's good for our neighborhoods. It's good for public safety. Yeah. I mean, it's good all the way around. It's yeah. a common sense. Hmm. Common sense. But if I could have you guys back up just a little bit, because you're uh, along with what you're yeah. saying, the expungement process itself is very confusing, mm -hmm. okay? And, it, and you're right, every single case is a little bit different and the kind of the flow chart that you have to go through to even get to an expungement is very different. Briefly walk us through some of the, the kind of the process of going through and getting an expungement. So first step is to get screened and to see what you're eligible for, right? So we are lucky that I'm able to do my job with a website called Rossa Legal. Um, they are a legal tech company and essentially it takes your criminal history and puts your charges into categories or buckets of what you may qualify for. So if you meet with an intake coordinator, we screen you, let you know what you may be eligible for, and then kind of let you know, hey, the first step is to apply to BCI, right? Um, through that process, roadblocks can pop up, right? If you have unpaid fines, you're, you're stopped in the process, dead in the water until those are paid. Um, or if you have an open plea of abeyance or something that we didn't find immediately, that's going to be a barrier too. And then after you apply to BCI, uh, you have to wait four to five months for a determination letter from them to get your certificate numbers. Gotcha. Um, so that's just a waiting period. And right. since expungements are up 300%, BCI is backlogged to about For those of you months. that don't know, BCI is Bureau of Criminal <laughs> Investigations. I figure everybody knows our lingo. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. Like you step into criminal justice and it's like, oh yeah, the DPS, UDC, yeah. and ABC, yeah. D, E, F. And yeah. It's like, what, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the reality is when I started this position, I had tried starting my own expungement and I had jumped shipped because it it feels very intimidating, right? right. The, the verbiage, the language used is almost by design to intimidate, right? Right. Um, so well, it's legalese, right? It, like it's mm -hmm, just something exactly. that it's like, unless you speak it, yeah. it's a completely different language. I have no idea language. what you're talking yeah. about. I think one of the biggest things for me when I started was realizing how many people have dismissals, right? Mm -hmm. How many people went to court and had a judge throw it out and essentially say, hey, this is gonna drop off your record, complete the claim of abeyance, it'll fall off. This terminology that is not accurate at all. Um, so a lot of people have dismissals with without prejudice. It doesn't matter. It's going to be on your record. It may eventually fall off automatically, but the vast majority of the time people are under the impression that those dismissals are not on their record, and that's just not the case. Interesting. So do, I, I, I'm, I don't know anything about, about that. I, again, correction side, I don't deal with the courts. I, I'm really happy that I don't have to deal with the courts. Yeah. So in that you're saying dismissal process like is that something where it's just the judge's discretion they can dismiss it and then it's like a certain do they have different thresholds of dismissal is that why it may or may not is it, or, or is it based off of the crime I, so tech so a dismissal is generally with or without prejudice without prejudice the judge cannot try it again correct right and with, oh, okay. with prejudice if the judge were to get new evidence he can't try it's again. the opposite. opposite so with prejudice listen to this, this is really confusing <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> <laughs> either way it's it's just depends on the wait period one is 30 days one is 180 days okay, but they gotcha. both can be expunged right away pretty much um, a lot of times when people are in specialty drug court programs or a mental health program right or a family drug court program their charges will be dismissed upon completion of that uh, program Ah, so they actually okay gotcha. and then people don't realize that's that an they need a, thing right right you, you complete your treatment you do everything that's what you're supposed to do you become self-sufficient again right and then they dismiss the charges but th what they don't tell you is that they still show up on a background check as a dismissal until and, you go through the expungement right, process right gotcha and it seems like historically the expungement process is more of it at least the way my my internal bias runs, it's like expungements are for rich white people, right? It's like if you have if money, you, have money yeah. you pay a lawyer, they get they go do everything for you, and then boom, bada bing, you're you're expunged, and you yeah. can go get a job anywhere, and no one knows what happened. Which right. is extremely expensive. Yes, uh, yes, mm -hmm. yes, it is. And that still holds true, but there is now opportunity for less expensive attorneys, right? Irasa is a 
uh, the cheapest attorney available for expungements and 402 reductions. Gotcha. Um, but it is very possible to do on your own, especially with resources and individuals who have been through the process. Everybody on our team has been through their own expungement process. So it's a matter of lived experience. Right. So you can call and ask questions and say, hey, what do, what do I do on this part, right? Um, most of the information that you need for your petitions is given to you from BCI. Um, the only thing you do not have is, is your judge associated with each case, and we can give that to you. Um, give you just a sample of the document mm -hmm. and once you kind of just see an example of it it, it no longer has this big shroud of mystery and there's so much anxiety around am I going to do it incorrectly and they're going to reject it um, so it is still possible to do without having to pay an attorney but there are now other fees associated right right so that's becoming a barrier again um, and we try to let our people know when they're coming through and applicants know hey this is coming up in four or five months when BCI responds to you start squirreling aside some money, right? Because mm -hmm. for every charge you submit to the court to expunge, it's $150. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Yeah. So, so there used to be a, a law in place for the last year. It was a pilot program where the cost of expungement was only $65. But it was only for one year. It just sunsetted okay. in June. Gotcha. So now it's about 280 per case wow. to expunge. And that's just in government fees. That's not getting a lawyer So that's all. just administrative right. fees. It's just government fees. So we are wow. in a communication with the representatives to try to find a middle ground between no fees and some fees um, we had a great meeting about it today hopefully we'll get a uh, lower fees right come in the next legislative session so you guys aren't just doing the expungement you're not just oh, helping no. people with expungements and, and resources <laughs> you're doing legislative you're you're lobbying for legislative change yeah. too yeah I'm all I'm everywhere I, I traveled the I travel all over the place to speak. I go to Dallas, to Texas, to what? I was just in Washington, D.C. last week. Was it last week? Yeah. The week before with the wow. NBA doing a town hall about the clean slate law. Right. Um, and raising awareness about that. That'll be aired on CNN sometime in this month in August. Wow, that's awesome. Um, but we do much more than just expungement. So we also fundraise to help people with those government fees. Right. So it's going out to uh, one of our biggest partners is the... Larry H. and Gail Miller Family Foundation. Oh, They've awesome. given us a huge chunk of money to help just with government fees to help people through the process until we can find a legislative fix for it. Hmm. So you guys are a nonprofit then? We so are a nonprofit. Okay. We have no lawyers yeah. on staff. Right. Um, but everybody on my staff knows how to do it. Right. right. Huh. So with um, the fees coming back as well, when Destiny started as our executive director, she increased the um, poverty level or the amount of people that we could help as far as financially. Um, it previously was, I think, 200% or below federal poverty limit, and then we could help with your application fee and some of the other subsequent fees. That is now increased to 300%. Destiny bumped that up as soon as she started. So we are now able to pay for the vast majority of people that come through. The unfortunate reality is when you have a criminal history, you're not making top dollar. Um, before I started on with Clean Slate, I was working at hires because that is the only job I thought that I could get. Um, and that is not a high paying job. I was super, super grateful for the work, but it is very hard to afford these government fees when you're making 10, When you can barely 13. scrape by already. Right. I mean, yeah. even when you have a decent job, you can't. Yeah. When I was going through my expungement, I was working in the county mayor's office at a government job and making $43,000 a year. Right. My expungement was over $3,000. I didn't have Oof. an extra $3,000 in my savings yeah. after rebuilding my life from homelessness, right? Yeah. I didn't have that in savings. So. They did a fund, the office did a fundraiser to pay for my expungement. Oh, wow. So that's why I raised the limit is because I was in a government agency working for the mayor and I still couldn't pay for it. Yeah. And so people don't have that story. Yeah. People don't get that opportunity like I got. And it's important to raise those limits so we can help, we can help a lot more people. Yeah. I don't think many people realize just how many people are struggling with money yeah, yeah. <laughs> but especially if you have any sort of criminal background it becomes a, mm -hmm. you know you hear about the stories and it's great and they're feel-good stories right someone comes out of prison they've gotten some sort of vocational training and boom they're into some they're like in a welding job where they're making six figures right, a, year. a journeyman tile setter that sounds something. great right. but Very when few. you exactly That's when you few. realize there are 2600 people incarcerated in one facility in that facility you're going to get 10% that are available for program, 10% of those individuals are, are eligible for programming. And of those 10% of that 2,600, so now we're down to 260. And now of those 260, we have maybe 
10 spots for some sort of vocational training for welding right. or 10 spots for an IT training or something like that. It just doesn't, the, the resources aren't there to help mm -hmm. everyone. Right. And the math just doesn't math. It yeah. just doesn't work out. And a lot of people, when they do get out of prison, when they do get out of jail, you have a long period of time of being on probation, being on parole, where you are supervised. And that also can detract from your work, right? Now you yeah. have people that are going to stop by your place of employment, stop by your place of where you live, right? Um, so by the time they're off parole, off probation, it, it still is kind of a barrier because they have this other hoop to jump through. Yeah. Um, yeah, trying to convince people. We've been, we, we've kind of been working on a lot of initiatives to try to convince business owners, local or national business owners, like look, or, or corporations. These are people that you want working for you. These are people that have reformed. They are, they, they, they need jobs. That's how I got my job. Yeah. The mayor of the county, Ben McAdams, started the specialty drug court program after Operation Rio Grande. Right. I was arrested during Operation Rio Grande. Ah, And he yes. was asking employers throughout the county to hire people in the drug court program. He was hearing from workforce services. These individuals have the skills. They have the knowledge. Yeah. They want to work. Yep. But nobody will hire them. Yep. What can we do? Yeah. And so we started asking employers, and someone said, well, who have you hired? And so he offered me a job. That's super Thank goodness, because cool. it changed everything for me and, and that that's the case like that happens so often or mm -hmm. that's the story if you're able to get into the, if someone's able to give you that opportunity it's life-changing yeah absolutely. you just need to get the opportunity people mm -hmm. just need to realize that, it, that there's a huge pe group of people willing to help right and people who are given that chance will work their butt off for you exactly. so I actually met destiny when I was inpatient at Odyssey house I was a resident I am now an Odyssey house graduate but when I got out she tracked me down and offered me a job um, it was on a kind of part-time basis and I worked my butt off because it, when given the opportunity people who have not had that opportunity we will show up we will work hard we will overperform right um, so when the opportunity came and I was able to get promoted that happened and it it has been absolutely life-changing in the past it has been working construction right because that's the only job I could get right. and now being able to work from home and manage a sober living um, Destiny's kind of passed along the opportunity she's had with working at the mayor's office to me um, and hopefully one day I'll be able to pass that along as well. The, the individuals who are able to get jobs without having this burden of a criminal history, not only are they incredibly grateful, but they will show up every single day and work their butt off and be happy to do it. Well, that was the best point, employee least. in the mayor's office, I want you to know. I, I bet, I totally <laughs> I was, believe it. I will, actually, in my exit speech, I said that because I feel like I was the best employee. Well, and to be fair, anyone who leaves government and starts their own thing, they are way over motivated to yeah. be working in the government. And I think what my motto was, if I'm running this organization, my staff members are going to be, have colonel backgrounds, are going to have lived experience. Yeah. That's the whole point, right? Yeah. yeah. No, and, and to your point, uh, it, it spider webs out, right? You help, right. you give one person that opportunity, that person can share that opportunity, and then those people can share that opportunity, and it just grows. Right. Yeah. I think one of the barriers that I've noticed in the past is if people that have not gone through the expungement process or do not have a criminal history start doing this work. Um, I have seen people maybe get a little bit jaded, right? Or have um, maybe a misinterpretation of how individuals with a criminal history are, right? Right. Especially once, I, I also was an individual who had a lot of homelessness in my past, right? It is very, very easy to get new charges when you're living on the streets. Right. Criminal trespassing, right? Um, so those charges start to accumulate and I think if, unless you've lived that or experienced it, at least in close proximity, um, I, I've just seen the mentality where people assume you did something to get the charge, right? Um, you must have been in the wrong in some way, shape, or form. Your Otherwise, decisions. Your, right. your life, right. your decisions, your fault. Exactly. The stigma. Yep. The and that stigma. stigma is still very, very prevalent. And it, it's, it's frustrating, but it's still there. So the more people that we can help to get away from that, right. uh, hopefully the, the less and less that stigma will be involved in our reality. I like that. It's really good. Yeah. Um, I, had a, I had a thought there. Oh, man. Oh, yes. I wanted to. I, I recent. Okay. So uh, s some news articles just came out. You may have seen them. You may not. They're really not a big deal. Talking about uh, APMP doing their fugitive uh, operation. They did it like a, a week ago. And we brought a bunch of. So oh, yeah, alphabet soup. <laughs> adult, adult probation and parole. My brain too, yeah. <laughs> so uh, adult probation and parole, which is a part of the Utah Department of Corrections, and they're the ones who supervise anyone who is on probation or mm -hmm. parole. Uh, so those who are uh, coming out of prison, and typically if you're on parole, that's going to be coming out of prison and you still have a quote-unquote sentence, and you are carrying out that sentence outside of prison. And then there's probation, which means you never went to prison. 
uh, you're just, you have, a, instead of being sentenced to prison, you're being sentenced to supervision uh, and, and what you described, right? You're gonna have people coming and checking on you at your house. You're gonna have people coming and checking on you at work. You might have drug tests, you yeah. get whatever the different requirements vary depending on what you did uh, or, or what you allegedly did. Uh, <laughs> Good catch. During that, during that fugitive night, so, the, the Fugitive Night is essentially an operation that they do once a month. They bring a, a huge group of uh, adult probation and parole agents out into the field uh, and try to find individuals who have absconded from uh, probation or parole. Um, that is kind of sidelined to when I was in, when I was there, because I was, I was there for that Fugitive Night, uh, someone was talking about Operation Rio Grande. Rio Grande, mm -hmm. Rio Grande, Rio and Grande. Rio Grande. <laughs> what, can you talk a little bit more? So you were on the shit end of that stick. What? Yeah, literally <laughs> sleeping in a park, no shoes on my feet. Um, I think. So yeah, describe, I'm first, first so, someone who it maybe isn't in Utah even, like what was Operation Rio Grande? Like what was the purpose of it? And then how did it impact you? So I think the purpose of it was our government got together to clean up that the block downtown. So right. during in that block area, people were openly shooting up, getting high, right. having sex, defecating, doing all kinds of things out in open air. Tent city. Yeah. Right. An open yeah. drug market. Yeah. I mean, it was it was very easy to get anything you wanted. And by just walking in proximity to that location. Right. So I think at a certain point our government was done and this was mm -hmm. their reaction. Right. And so their idea was to open up more treatment beds. Uh, arrest people, get, give them the op opportunity for treatment, right? and it will all be better. Um, I've seen lots of different, I have different opinions about it. For me, it saved my life. It okay. literally gave me the opportunity to go to treatment because I was a low-level offender. I had only misdemeanor <clears throat> charges. Right. So I was never offered a drug court program because I wasn't a felon. Right. And so this operation had so much funding attached to it that I was offered treatment. But on another side, it did criminalize homelessness right it did do a lot of damage as well yeah yeah it's kind of like that's the mixed feeling that i mm -hmm. that's what i have kind of perceived from people right it's like how do you get the good without the bad yeah like, and yeah. i really think you can arrest anybody but if they're not ready they're not ready right right, right? you right. know and if you're arresting a whole group of all their friends together and putting them all in the same treatment center together odds are they're going to run together as well right yep. yeah so. you're not changing it <laughs> you may be changing the environment the friends are still okay. there and the right. friends are the big influence. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And but it changed it. my life. Absolutely changed my life. Hmm. Yeah. That's an interesting perspective to hear because mm -hmm. from someone who I, I wasn't involved in criminal justice when that happened, I am only hearing about it as a third party. Uh, and a lot of what I perceived from it is like, man, that was not the way to go about doing that. Probably wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's interesting to hear that it did. I mean, you got to take the wins where you can, yeah. right? If it, if it worked for you and it worked maybe for a few other people, like at least it was better than, than nothing. Yeah, I know a lot of people that are successful today that was also in Operation Rio Grande Drug Court with me and is very successful. Right. Um, and I know a lot, and a lot of them have the same stories. They were cycling in and out of jail on misdemeanor charges, was never yep. offered a felony drug court program. So this opened up a lower level drug court program for those participants to enter into and get the same type of treatment even if they didn't have a felony conviction. Which is probably the lesson to be learned there, right? right. Like if we just open up the resources, right. we don't necessarily need to need to send out the entire uh, SWAT squad to go arrest everyone on the block. Maybe we just need to give these people some more resources. On every single corner. Yeah. I mean, it, it was bad. It was intense. Absolutely. Yeah. I was in active addiction during that time. And as somebody experiencing that substance use, I was just mad. <laughs> I can't even imagine. Because like, they came through with military force and, mm -hmm. and just closed down if you're going everything. Through a mental health crisis, right. at the same time that it essentially looks like your government is waging war on you. And yeah, that's exactly what it looked like. That is, Helicopters. Yeah. And I was in the state of mind where I thought I didn't look like a drug addict. Right. So I'm like, I can walk. <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to walk on out of here. Walk right past See y'all later. <laughs> They're not going to stop me, right? No teeth, track marks all over. I'm like, I look good. I was, I was mistaken and proven wrong. Absolutely mistaken. Those agents were like, uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, yeah. and that, that grandiosity too, and just thinking, oh, we're fine. Yeah. We got this. Yeah. Um, no, 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 not me. It's those guys right, down yeah. there. Right. They're right back there. I left them for you guys. <laughs> um, but the reality is too, that when people do get treatment, right, and they do decide to change those behaviors, everything about that changes. And mm-hmm. it, just the opportunity to go to treatment, even if it does not work that time, right. maybe the, the next time or three times later, it will work. Even if it takes you seven tries to get it right, I am happy to be one of those tries. I'm happy to be involved and get you closer to that end goal. Nobody will get to that point until they are truly and utterly ready. Um, yeah. And that looks different for everybody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but maybe that that getting you in the door is that first step towards realizing that. We always say at the at, at the Department of Corrections that it, it, it it's exactly aligned with what you guys are talking about, right? Like it, it uh, you, you, the person needs to be ready ready they, they they need to have the the impetus to do it and then yeah. we can provide the resources to to get them there but without their their decision it's never gonna it's happen it's never gonna happen i think another good thing that came out of that is they started uh, salt lake county started a sober living voucher program so i was the first one to use that sober living voucher that gave you a place to go after inpatient treatment oh, that wasn't cool. back to your parents or back to a shelter or back to the friends that you used to use with uh, they would provide three to six months of rent for you in a sober living home so you can get a job, you can huh. become stable, you can um, become self-sufficient again. That sober living voucher is something that is still very much a part of my life because I now manage a sober living. I also went through Odyssey and was able to take advantage of the sober living voucher. So, so for those that are yeah. unfamiliar, what's Odyssey? Odyssey House is an inpatient residential treatment program. They have men's mental health, women's mental health, and adolescent program. Um, it is a, one of the longer programs that you're inpatient. I was in residential 10 months, uh, and then I was an outpatient for about six months. Um, it's a behavioral modification program. It is for dual diagnosis, mental health conditions, as well as substance use disorder. Um, it, it is a very hard program. It is very difficult, but it is absolutely worth it. I had been to numerous treatment centers prior to that, um, and for whatever reason this time, I was just ready and looking at why I started to use in the first place was really that I needed to address so I could get beyond it and beyond some of those those survival behaviors that worked. Those, those uh, you know, what, I mean, thinking errors, right? They call them thinking errors or um, beliefs. maladjusted behaviors that, that worked for us our entire lives. Addressing why those began in the first place can really help you get beyond that. Um, and now if, if I have stress or I have a trigger, I don't react the same way, right? I don't even have the same triggers. So it, it's almost like you can get past that. You can do EMDR, you can do trauma therapy, but you're also looking at, at your peers um, and asking what they see, right? What do you see in my behaviors? Tell me what you're seeing, right? And by looking at yourself mm-hmm. through the eyes of a peer, you kind of see how you're presenting yourself to the world. Um, so that can look like anything from being over-sexualized, right? Or just being a little bit protective of yourself so you're a little bit snippy, right? That's coming across as you being angry. That's coming across as you don't want people near you. Mm-hmm. So by hearing other people's opinions, as hard as it is to hear, you're able to look at that and say, hey, that that's relevant to me. I'll take that and I'll digest it, right? Yeah. Other stuff, you just let it go, but there's a lot that that is very, very hard to hear, um, but it's important to hear what how the world sees you. Whether you like it or not, if the vast majority of people around you are seeing you in this light, it's something to look at. Do you wanna present yourself like that? Do you wanna be more communicative and, and a little bit different in your approach to move forward and get where you wanna be in life? So it, it certainly had a profound impact on my life. Might as well, we're both Odyssey House graduates. Oh, nice. Oh, very, nice. very nice. So would you also say, I mean, was, was the Operation Rio Grande, was that kind of your catalyst? Like, oh, we got to we gotta ch- ch- change course here. Or was it after that? Uh, so it was after that for me. Um, and we talk about people ha- hitting their rock bottom, right? That looks so different for everybody. Right. Um, I was in a situation where I was getting out of a toxic relationship and I was back to being homeless at 35 years old with nothing to show. Um, and it, it, it just, it was really frustrating to sit in that light and realize that it didn't matter how much history I had. Like it didn't matter what I did in my past. At the end of the day, nobody cares. Nobody's here. I have nobody to call. I have no food to eat. I have nowhere to stay. Um, and I, I was just desperate. I was so sick of doing what I had done for so many years, you know, um, going through the process of being homeless, going through sex work, right? And just doing these things just to survive. I was just done. Um, at that point, I simply decided that I will try this route. If this doesn't work, then my plan was just, that's what we'll say. <laughs> my plan was really just to end it. I was so over it at that point that if Odyssey didn't work, screw it, right? 
Um, I was actually online looking for my next client um, and the person I reached out to I had gone to high school with and he started talking to me about the fact that he'd gone to Odyssey House and he was a different person. His voice, his um, mannerisms were totally different and we had, you know, we had been doing the most for years and just to hear him speak completely differently in a very, very positive way if it can change somebody like that, I had I had to have a little bit of hope that it might be able to help me. Um, so when I showed up, I just decided I was just gonna surrender. No matter what happened, no matter how hard it got, I was not gonna run, and I didn't. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I remember that's that day a, she showed up. I was a staff member. <laughs> I was a, I worked at Odyssey House on the What did weekends. that look like to you? Ooh, yeah. She oh, was gracious. a hot mess, you know? But I watched, <laughs> she was a hot mess, but I watched her and watched her and watched her grow and watched her grow that when I left Odyssey House to take on this role, the minute she got out, I tracked her down because I oh, knew I really? wanted to give her a job. Yeah. Because I watched her grow so much. She had all these skills. She was putting it to work, holding people accountable, being responsible. Um, I knew I had to have her. <laughs> Isn't that, I'm that's... super, super grateful for that. I think what's wonderful about destiny as my boss as well is destiny's almost six years sober i'm getting close to two years sober our recovery is the most important thing to us right if i'm struggling destiny will have a conversation with me like hey where's your head out how are you feeling and we'll talk about it in a real human way like yes work is here but your recovery comes first your family your recovery your life comes before anything else the stress of the job because it can certainly get stressful especially when we're in the legal world and everything feels so intimidating um, you know, I, I get calls from people all day, every day, and they are just panicked, full-blown panic. And I got to a point where it, it was very hard to manage for me because yeah. I'd never dealt with, you know, home work life balance. Um, and Destiny was able to talk to me and say, hey, it's time to look into some resources. So I got a recovery coach. She's offered to help me get some classes for whatever I want to indulge in, right? Whether that's some self-care things or whether that's going back to school, whatever I can do to better myself so that I can serve the population we're trying to help. She's a good employee. I'm not going to lose her after I tracked her out. <laughs> <laughs> You're invested She's in this so one. She's so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I totally, I, I can empathize with that, though. Like, the, it is it is difficult to work in these environments. Like, right. it, it, can, it is really taxing. It, and it takes a lot of focus on your own mental health to be able to help other people in this way. Absolutely. And we're learning as, we, as we're going yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I think a risk we all face in this, especially in the nonprofit world, right, is compassion fatigue. Because yeah. especially with how deeply we care for our, for people that we're helping, um, you have to be able to, to almost hone that in, right? Um, at 5 p.m., my phone goes on, do not, do not disturb. I yep. do not answer work calls. Where in the past, if someone was calling me, it was like, oh, it must be really important, right? Well, regardless of what that is, my mental health comes first, and I'm going to take time, go back to doing my crochet or going for a walk, whatever makes me feel good about my day, and then come back to it the following day. Um, even when I filed my expungement paperwork at the beginning of July, I was stressed out. Just filling out the paperwork that I, I walk people through <laughs> a, dozen, a dozen times a day, I was like, oh my gosh, am I going to fill this out wrong? And Destiny's kind of just looking at me, shaking her head. When <laughs> you it comes, do this all day with everybody. <laughs> when it comes to your actual paperwork, it's just, it's such a big deal, right? I mean, this is a a whole new life that I'm getting the opportunity to, to hopefully get get granted, right? Um, the idea of not having a criminal history is, is mind boggling to me because it has always been a barrier. Since yeah. the time I was 18 years old, it has always been part of the conversation, whether you're going to volunteer, whether you're getting a job, whether you're looking for a new place to live. Um, I mean, it's, it almost makes me emotional to think about. We have a, a good friend that was an Odyssey graduate that had his uh, pardon granted. And this has been, I mean, he has had a very hefty criminal record his entire life, and he is now crime-free. Like, wow. wow. It, it just, it's absolutely incredible to think about his life is completely drastically altered forever. Even if, worst case scenario, that he go, decides to go back down a similar path, he still was given a chance that the vast majority of people will never get mm -hmm. to have a clean slate. Like, yeah. there couldn't be a more fitting name for our organization because it truly is a brand new opportunity to start fresh. What you do with that is up to you, but it is one of the most empowering things that anybody can attain is getting a new, like a clean slate and a try, a fresh start. It's, it's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so do you guys reach out? So you were saying that there's the, obviously we've got the clean slate law, people don't know about it. It could, 
hap- they could they could fall into these buckets they they could not but they just don't even know about it are you actively reaching out to people to try to disseminate this information are people coming to you like what i saw we we met you guys yeah. at or or at least originally i saw your guys's booth at uh the uh, what was it the sober riders mm-hmm. event that we were at just a little while ago we do both so okay. we have a coalition of 50 community partners that ranges from like catholic community services uh, LDS Church to Utah Harm Reduction Coalition to Soap to Hope, all these different organizations in in Utah that help us get information out to right. their populations, and they might be the trusted person in their population. We also sign up for all kinds of events and booths. Um, we get on the news quite often, um, and then we also um, have billboards around Salt Lake Valley as well. We have four or five different billboards. Okay. I don't know where. I haven't seen them. <laughs> but I know we have them. <laughs> the previous executive director set them up. We have four billboards, um, and we're just trying to get as loud as we can in the community. I love it. Do Odds get... are everybody we meet has know somebody who has a criminal record, and so we get uh, intakes, tons and tons of intakes every single day. And the, I'm sure it's kind of that same spider web, right, where, like, someone finds out about it, they go through your process, and then it's like, oh, this works. Mm-hmm. Like, right. i got to tell all my friends. Ever, anyone else who I know who needs this help, Absolutely. they'll know about it. Usually, so I meet, I screen people all through Zoom, right? At the end of a Zoom call, people are usually super, super grateful, and they're like, hey, what can I do to help you? Right. Please talk to your friends and family. I right. guarantee there's Spread some the people message. in your life that have the situation. Anybody that you know, or even if you don't know, they have a criminal history, hand them my card. You know, Pass out my number to anybody and everybody. Um, most people, when they start to think about it, they realize, oh, maybe I did catch a charge for that. Um, and it, it, it's pretty easy to happen, especially if it was years and years ago. So the more we can get talked about, and that's why I was super excited to come do this, because I think after the fee waiver ended, um, uh, we kind of lost a little bit of traction. And that has regained itself, but it almost felt as if that fee waiver pilot program ended, and now people were either intimidated or just thought we were just a you know a temporary nonprofit to help people get through this this fee waiver period, and that's just not the case. Um, we have more work to do now than, now than ever, now that fees are back. Um, so we just it's really important for me and for everybody who comes in contact with us to keep talking about clean slate to keep talking about having a criminal record but also to talk about it openly and and know that that stigma whether people will retain that stigma or not it, it does it's not relevant to who you are as a person and that there are people who will see you for you regardless of what your charges are and we also branch out we have an intake coordinator in st george oh, uh, we partner with usara in st george and we have a fingerprint clinic every thursday at usara in salt lake we're out in Clearfield once a month. We're out in Tooele once a month. We'll be going to Ogden. So we're trying to branch out all over because it is the entire state of Utah. It's not just Salt Lake County. Right. So right. we're trying to reach as many people as possible. And you also said that other states are picking up this law, mm-hmm. right? We're now 12 yep. states deep. Is your plan to try to expand what you guys are doing into That's other right. states? Is it already happening? So our plan is to expand here in Utah. So I would like to expand the law to include more misdemeanors and maybe even some drug felony convictions. That's a little bit out. It's not anything in the near future. We have to fix the implementation process that we're going through now. Gotcha. Um, But the plan is always to add more, add more, add more. Uh, Pennsylvania just added felonies in their clean slate law, and Colorado also has felonies in their clean slate law. So it's being expanded throughout these different states, um, and the clean slate initiative's goal is to get it 50 states wide. Hmm. So hmm. they have some big supporters like John Legend. Legend is a big supporter. He just put out a big video about Clean oh, Slate Utah. Cool. Um, the NBA is a big supporter. The National Basketball Social Justice Coalition is using their platforms and their players and things to get the word out. So it's it's becoming a movement nationwide. That's super cool. Yeah. yeah. Common sense movement. So, it's just common sense. Right. 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 Yeah, totally. Right. People deserve to work and provide for their families. It's a working bill. I'm curious if you guys have looked into or uh, attempted to get into. So when someone releases from prison, they go through a reentry orientation. Uh, there's typically, they go through this room, they talk to a bunch of different organizations that kind of, it's like a, like when you were in elementary school and you're like going and talking to all the different people about like yeah. the projects <laughs> yeah. and like, oh, what can you do? What, what candy do you have? And like that same thing happens when you, you get released from prison. Is that something that you guys have tried to be a part of or could be a part of? We, I don't know. We do the Tooele Reentry Fair in Tooele. We're doing Davis County tomorrow Reentry nice. Fair. We would like to get up to, um. The prison reentry fair, but yeah. we are going to be going into the prison soon. We just, I just completed paperwork to go in there and talk about clean slate for the individuals that are in the program getting ready to be released. Nice. So we're trying to get everywhere. 
I mean, if you have a hookup, hook me up. <laughs> we'll talk. Okay. We'll talk. <laughs> we also like going to treatment centers. Anywhere that asks us to come speak, we'll come speak. Uh, when we go into treatment centers, we'll screen people as we're there. Yeah, I think this would that it, you definitely it seems like what you guys do would fit so well into a reentry orientation. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, it seems like you know to your point of trying to get the word out there and get as much involvement in the community as you can like doing the speeches or doing speaking and being able to speak in the facilities would i feel like yeah. would be huge because you yeah right. you, you've got you you've got 96 percent of the people that you're going to be talking to will be coming out yeah uh, they, the gonna... only problem is is that they're on probation or parole they don't qualify until they're off until they're off but what we've noticed is that when i took over clean slate utah there wasn't pardon support and we were noticing that more people needed a pardon mm. than people who actually needed an expungement interesting and so we brought on pardon support so just to get to those reentry fairs talk to people let them know that they could potentially qualify for a pardon if they remain crime free for five years right um and it could change your whole entire life you plant that seed and that could make a big yeah. difference in someone's life yeah. Right. And the bottom line, too, is even if you know the waiting period, right, if it's a matter of having all of that information, knowing you have a five-year waiting period, you can then gauge your progress through that waiting period, right? right? So you have an end goal. You have something to, to put on paper and, and make a part of your routine and it's something that you're planning to have a part of your life. So even if you're in a wait period, at the very beginning of a wait period, um, it still is really important to know that because you can then implement different tools into your life so you can maintain this path you're currently on so you can get to that point where you can get a pardon you can get an expungement um i would say that maybe a little bit more than half of the people that i screen do need a pardon and it it is certainly a lot of work however it is 100 percent doable it's a lot of documentation gathering um, and a lot of people will get screened on the rasa app and rasa does not do pardons so it, they will get an automated email that says hey you do not qualify mm-hmm. and that can be a huge deterrent uh, we try to, you know, meet those people there and just say, hey, that may not be a path that you can hire somebody for, but we do have support for you. It's a right. matter of being able to sit down and put together a binder. Um, it's absolutely doable, but you need to be willing to sit down and put in an hour, you know, on the weekends and, and work to get your police reports. And we will help support you and, and hold your hand through that. But our whole mission is to empower you to do this for yourself, right? right? So we can't actually do it for you, but we will be here when you need to ask questions. We will be here to tell you the next step. I like to think of it as how do you eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. Yeah. So we're going to say, hey, this is the first step. Now we're in a wait period. During this wait period, you can start working on getting letters of recommendation. Um, so it, it's been really cool to see the Board of Pardons is really wonderful right now. Oh, well, they are. Yeah. I went to the Board of Pardons today and sat in on a pardon hearing, and it was amazing. It was amazing. That, that's good to hear. Well, yeah. yeah. Dive into that. Yeah, so with the, we went and observed for a pardon hearing so we can prepare our clients on how to, right? what it's going to look like, right? And so this individual that was going for a pardon, he had some pretty hefty charges, a lot of felonies, aggravated. Um, but they ask him about each and every charge, then they get, to, they get to the good stuff after that. Like, how did you change your life? And, like, I bawled my eyes out in that room. The story was so impactful, and it was so... It was so magical that I walked out of there feeling like, oh, yeah, these guys have no idea what's coming to them because I'm bringing a flood of people in there and we're going to help so many people because most people. You're sitting in the back. just Yeah. Like, yeah. Absolutely. And the great thing is I walked into the Board of Pardons hearing and the Board of Pardon members knew who I was because I'm active out here in the community when right. before I'd be running from those guys. Right. Right. You know, so like the, the everything has switched. But knowledge is power. And I think that most people that we talk to have no idea if they could even get an expungement or a pardon at all. Right. They just figured they couldn't. Right. When they don't even see it as There's a pathway for everything. Yeah. There's a pathway for everything. So, do you have a, do you, uh, I saw you writing things down. I've got, I'm gathering my questions as we go through here. <laughs> <laughs> see, I, I didn't figure it would be a problem. Me and Destiny are talkers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we talk numerous times a day, and especially when we start talking about the legal stuff, I mean, we're extremely passionate, so we're happy to, to talk all night. Well, we really <laughs> so talk might about have to cut us off. How can we make this simple? Like, on the on the court website, BCI website, it says all these legally languages. Yeah. Like, let's sit down and figure out how we can put it in one simple sentence that anybody even a fourth grader could understand right yep. because that's what we need to do we need to put it in really really simple language so that anybody who's reading it can understand so they can get to the next step yeah and so that's what we, we do most of the time is deep dive into things uh, and try to make it more simple well and i think probably the, the even bigger before you get to that point of explaining the process is people need to know that it's possible mm-hmm. right right first and foremost they need to and like you were saying if you can, if we can line this up, and then you have an end date, and you've got a goal, and you can put something on the calendar, I don't care what your goal set is, that makes it a lot easier. 
and getting through and, and going through recovery, going through the Odyssey House, all the different programs that you have, that's got to help tremendously. Right, and it makes it attainable just to know somebody that has been through the process and has successfully been through the process. Um, I mean, prior to meeting Destiny, I did not know of anybody who had ever tried to get an expungement, who ever had ever successfully gotten an expungement. Um, so just knowing by proximity, right? It's almost like that success can, can rub off onto you by knowing somebody else who has gone through the process, it's possible. Um, and, and once this law went through, I mean, the pathway is more clear. It is much more apparent than it ever has been. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not still murky as heck, um, but it is now much, much clearer um, and having support. I mean, we are people's cheerleader. I mean, as soon as people tell me their, their expungement has been granted, I might call them. I'm writing them an email with a million exclamation marks. I mean, I'm just so excited for other people that have made it through this process and the feeling of empowerment that you get when you know you went through this process and you did it for yourself and you will have the benefits the rest of your life without hiring somebody that was thousands of dollars. Right. You did this. You earned this. You worked through all the steps. You got to the end you point and that's a point huge of, success. Point Z, it was all right. you. Right. I think it's a huge one. misconception that you have to have an attorney to get this completed and you do not. Right. 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 Well, okay, so then the, the next part that I really, I really have a question for you. I knew um, that was going somewhere. <laughs> going so, until, and you, I'm, I'm, until you went there. I'm backing up a little bit. <laughs> but uh, the one thing I, I had a question on was, so you have the Odyssey House, which is a bigger, um, bigger organization. That's a bigger program, right? Yes. And then I'm going to assume, based on the way you were kind of talking about it, it was the, uh, the Sober Living Voucher. So mm -hmm. is that kind of a supplemental that would come after the Correct. Odyssey House? So while you are in residential treatment and it does not have to be just Odyssey House, you take a class called Fair Credit, which in just by itself is, in, is ingenious, right? So while you're in the house, you take a couple of classes that teach you how to save money, right? What debt looks like, how you can start planning um, to be financially responsible, especially if you have had substance misuse in your history. We don't know how to save, I don't know how to save money. I have never known how to any of you that. do now I do I do now I've been able to buy a vehicle it, it's but that's been a process right so you take a couple classes while you're in residential by taking those classes that um, those are the requirements for getting the voucher um, the first three months of the voucher is is completely free I think my biggest I mean the greatest thing that Odyssey did for me was set me up for success afterwards, right? Because I went to so many other treatment programs and I went right back into the same situation, whether that was the streets, whether that was a toxic relationship, whether that was sur like couch surfing, right? Um, I was super excited while I was in Odyssey because I knew I was going to sober living. I didn't have to pay rent. I didn't have to freak out that I don't even know how to take the bus. I don't have bus money. You get a bus pass. You have your EBT, your food stamps card. So the first couple of months you can get out and just adjust just yeah. to just to no longer being completely supervised the entire time and that's a huge adjustment for a lot of people right um especially odyssey house there's a lot of people i mean 60 to 80 people so you're used to being surrounded by a crowd all of a sudden you're you're in your own room at your own house and it it, it goes from being you know 60 miles on the freeway to just cold stop um and that that's a really big adjustment so for me i was really excited to have that transition period the next three months after the first free ones um, you pay 30% of your income. At the time I was working at higher, so 30% of my income was like $100, $200, right? And that still allowed me to start squirreling away some money so that I could plan for a future. Um, and then once I graduated the Odyssey program and I was off the voucher, I was offered an opportunity to be a house manager for Steps Recovery. So they kind of connect you like when you're going through the program or as you're approaching the end of the program, they're trying to find ways to keep you mm -hmm. all the things around pro social people trying mm -hmm. to find opportunities for you. So that, that's really cool to hear. I mean, it's not just Odyssey House, like First Step, House of Hope, Odyssey House. There's a number of treatment centers that all get it utilize this voucher. Right, right. Huh. I think I really enjoyed the fact that it, it was kind of a step down program too, right? Um, so that way it, it didn't stop all the way, but it was the simple things that I was worried about. Like I didn't, I had been in treatment for almost a year at that point. I didn't remember how to use a cell phone. I wasn't great with computers, um, but everything is baby steps, right? So even just handing me a bus pass where you, you can't do anything stupid with that. I mean, I, I guess, okay, okay. 
Back, back. <laughs> <laughs> so it, if, you, if you want to do something stupid, you can make it happen. It doesn't matter what tools you have. Um, but it was just one of the concerns I had. I had a lot of anxiety. How am I going to get to my UAs? How am I going to get to group? And just being presented with a bus pass, right? Just the ability to, to be mobile and be self-sufficient was really empowering for me. And that allowed me to kind of just take off and move forward in a direction I was really excited about. Hmm. That's super cool. I, I like what you were saying earlier about the Odyssey House, about the way that it, it helped you address these kind of these these things that you sh that you shouldn't be doing. You know, or you may or may not know that you shouldn't be doing them, but they're working for you, right? right? Like it, that's something that I think people in the general public don't realize a lot of the time is everyone does this everyone has things that are detrimental to your mental physical health your well-being that they but they're shortcuts and they work right. and so that reinforces that you should keep doing it. it's like it's working so i have to keep doing it because trying out something else or getting outside of that box is scary and yeah. so that's cool that, that it's just good to hear that there are people working on on modeling good behaviors in that way and, and trying to find like or recognize trying to help you recognize like oh i'm doing that and it's actually detrimental mm -hmm. even though it's working right. it's actually detrimental well and if i think about how i was raised right like you don't air your dirty laundry you don't talk about things and that was my household right we didn't talk about our feelings right um and i you know i also learned to be what i thought was empathetic because my my father was an alcoholic so it was almost my job to interpret if he was mad right or if he was you know sad because I had to be prepared for what was coming so that, you know, me thinking I'm empathic. No, I was just trying to predict his behavior so I could stay safe. Right. I also knew that it was not safe to voice my own emotions. So getting past that and starting to trust your environment and learn that it's okay for me to verbalize what I'm feeling, but also learning how to like verbalize what I'm feeling, even identifying feelings is very difficult. And what I kind of discovered that the people that I know that have graduated Odyssey or graduated a program, a really intense program, um, their ability to, to tell you what they're feeling um, is incredible. There's so many people in our world that don't, they can't express to you what they're feeling. They know they're stressed, right? They know that they have a headache, but they don't actually know what's going on deeper. I've got a little bit of work stress. I'm also worried when I go home that I'm gonna see my daughter sad. There's a lot of things that go into that and just being able to tell you what I feel is incredibly empowering because then I can address it, right? In the past, all I knew was that something was happening in here, right? There's something going on in my chest. It didn't feel good, and I wanted it to stop. That could have been any number of emotions, right? Um, a big part of what Odyssey does is it teaches you how to, to establish, like, how to identify what you're feeling, how to verbalize it or write it down, and then move forward. If you can't tell me what you're feeling, we can't get past it, right? So that was a big part of, of oh, sorry. It's okay. That was a big part of my, stop it. That was a big part of my treatment was was just being able to tell you what I'm feeling. Right. It was bound to happen. It was. I'm a, I'm a You're fidgeter. You're not the first and you won't Such be the a last. fidgeter. <laughs> well, back I on talk that. with my hands a whole bunch, so I'm sure like half of this is just my hand. Just like this. Ow. <laughs> Busted. I think everybody would uh, benefit from treatment. Yeah. Same type of treatment. Yeah. Point the camera at me. Point it at me. Get a therapist. Absolutely. You crazy people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but everybody could benefit from a therapist. It yeah, is we're so all crazy. helpful. Absol <laughs> absolutely. And I am self admittedly crazy, diagnosed crazy, <laughs> and I'm okay with that because I have figured out ways to manage it, right? Yeah. I have been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. I have been diagnosed with substance misuse, but there are ways to verbalize it, to talk about it, to deal with it. For me, I have to stay on a schedule, right? When I wake up in the morning, I get one cup of coffee. You don't get five. You don't get a, a rock star. You don't want to see her with five cups of coffee. <laughs> it's a real thing. Char, <laughs> how many cups of coffee did you have this morning? One and a half. Well, Go take a nap. It's just a matter of, of keeping yourself on a schedule, and that can be boring, right? But I wake up, I have one cup of coffee. At 9 p.m., I turn on my podcast. I go sit in my room and start winding down. Um, it's super important for me to stay on the schedule and to kind of modify my behavior around that schedule because it's what allows me to get up and, and, and maintain and feel happy. Like, yeah. I actually feel happy for the first time in my entire life at the age of 37 years old. I finally wake up and I, I, I'm not mad that I woke up. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm, I'm waking up and I'm, I'm ready to start my day. And this is truly a first for me The you know, the first year of recovery was not great. It was really hard. And once I got, you know, into my second, it has been wonderful and I am happy every day. 
That's awesome. I, that's weird to hear. <laughs> Even come, I, I remember those people that were happy and it just, I, I was mad, right? Like, oh, you're one of those disgusting, happy people. <laughs> right, like what is so wrong happy. with you? Absolutely, yeah. what is wrong with you? Yeah. And now I, I get it, but it took so much work and so much pain to get there. Yeah. Um, you really earn it. By the time you get there, you earn your stripes. What's really cool now being a manager of a sober living is I have people coming in at, at all different levels of recovery, 90 days, six months. Um, and watching them go through this process and start to learn themselves, learn their life and, and kind of decide what direction they want their life to go in is just so cool to see because everybody's path is different. I mean, everybody's path is beautiful and unique, but it also is really cool to see everybody hit these certain milestones where these light bulbs go off in their brain and they're like, oh my God, I realize why I do that now. And if you no longer want to do that, you can make some changes. You know, it's very interesting. You, you've made a couple, several points throughout this that I find kind of, from my background, I was an athlete all growing up for, for a very long time. But there's a lot of principles that carry over, and I, I think this is a message to a lot of different people. Getting on a schedule, having a routine is a very important aspect to, I don't care what your background, I don't care what you're doing. Yeah. If you're trying to be successful, you got to do yes. that. you got to do that. And that is step number one. Right. And even if you're starting with, okay, I'm going to wake up, I'm going to have a cup of coffee, and that's where we're going to start. Or, or the Jordan Peterson, wake up and make your bed. Yes. Right? That's Every a day. huge, big first step to yeah. getting on a, on a program. Yes. The other thing that I hear you saying that, that I think is translucent to anybody, I don't care what your background is, is you got to get around people that you want to be like. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because I, from what I'm hearing, you know, if you're homeless and you're, you're doing this and you're surrounding yourself, it perpetuates the problem. Absolutely. And the second, most people get out and they start making friends that are trying to strive for something higher and, and look for something more, that's when you can start pick up some traction. Yeah, no, you're absolutely, and it, it feels so cliche to say, right? Um, but it's so true and I'm almost mad that the cliche is true. But <laughs> <laughs> I was that rebel all growing up. I'm like, I don't wanna believe it, um, but it is imperative. And even making your bed, something so simple, when I walk back into my room later in between meetings or whatever, and I see that my room is nice, it's made up and it's welcoming, it's inviting, my headspace is so much easier yep. to 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 organize when my living quarters are are neat and orderly and organized my brain feels so much more peace when my when my house is a cluster i can't think straight i can't handle mess and that's simply because i can keep things organized in my brain when my physical environment is orderly it helps my brain stay organized yeah i agree with that 100 percent. yeah i mean it did take me a very long time to learn i had to have a schedule as much as that is and i have roommates that you know people that live at the sober living and they make fun of me because i'm like a little old lady going to bed at nine o'clock <laughs> same but i mean my boss also makes fun of me but <laughs> that's what i do i listen to my podcast i start my podcast right at 9 p.m and by the time my podcast is right is, is you know rounding out that i'm falling asleep and it's perfect and this works for me and that's what keeps me happy and if it didn't work i wouldn't be doing it but i've been doing it for almost two years now and it's working so i'm going to keep doing it Oh, wow. I like what you said. Surround yourself with people mm -hmm. that you strive to be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They show you your, your five friends. I'll show you your success, you know? Yeah. Yep. That was the whole genesis of this. Yeah. The, yeah. The, our motorcycle network was to solve that problem. Most guys, it, and we're talking about two different walks of life here, but most guys, you know, in the professional world, they don't talk to each other. There's mental health stuff with, with everybody, like you said. Yeah. Everybody needs to talk to somebody. Everyone. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in Utah, most guys... You know, they, they're married and they have kids and whatnot. And then and that ends. You don't have friends anymore, right? Mm -hmm. right? I am now stoic. Yeah. yeah right. and, we, and we don't <laughs> talk. Yeah. And so this, in, in large part, was trying to change who you're, you're associating with and, and, and building that core group of people that you can rely on to better yourself through, you know, life. And even just normalizing talking about your struggles. I mean, similar to how what you're expressing, right? We don't talk about that. You, you know, you just pull up your big girl britches and get moving, right? Um, when that's not the reality. By talking about it, we can move past it. You can't get past until you go through. Um, so for me, having those conversations, even when I'm stressed and I walk away from my computer, I'll call Destiny and we'll just have a conversation not about work. Um, what's going on with your daughter? What's going on this weekend? It's super important to be able to talk about other things besides your work home life, right? There's so much more to an individual. And I think just normalizing, talking about substance use disorder, talking about mental health conditions. Um, we all have something, um, whether it's worked or not worked for you, whether it's diagnosable or not, we all have something that we wish we could modify or we wish we could get a little bit better dealing with. 
And it's important to have that group of people to hold you accountable. Yes. Who sees you going a little stray and will say, hey, like, what's going on with you, you know? That is really important is to have a community that holds you accountable. Yeah. To keep you online. No, I agree. I agree with that entirely. That's the, again, the whole different circle, but baseball, that's where, that's where guys thrived. Is it's in, it, in our circle, it was competition. You held each other, you know, accountable but through competition, and we're working towards this goal, and each, everybody's pushing each other. Yep. And it works the same thing for what you're doing. Yep. If you're around people, okay, that are trying to do better, and they're trying to better their lives, mm-hmm. you're going to pick up on that. It, it rubs off. Yep, for sure, especially in recovery. In the past, I have never had people I surrounded myself with that had substantial recovery, right? Um, I'd go to AA meetings and see the old timers and just kind of, you know, um, pass them off as just old timers. But now I hang out with Destiny, who's got six years in recovery, right? We hang out at USERA, where I have a recovery coach who's got three years. Um, everybody in my world has some substantial recovery and they have something that I want, right? I want to have my own home and have a family, and, and Destiny has that. And surrounding myself with people who have achieved the goals that I hope to achieve myself one day helps it be more realistic for me and it's super important to see other people have that manage it but also still have struggles nobody's right. ever going to be perfect it's... you can have my toddler if you want <laughs> <laughs> you can I know. i'll take her for the weekend she is super duper cute though destiny does have an adorable daughter so i will sassy. take her for about a week she's very sassy she is very much like destiny and here's i mean her daughter seeing us advocate all the time right and, and get loud at these right. you know government meetings and on Capitol Hill, go testify. So she is certainly um, growing up to be just like her mom at four years old. She's already she's already very she fiery. She has a microphone and talking and speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I when I was like seven, I was up at the Capitol with my mom. She was working doing lobbying for the PTA, and that was like my initial exposure to government and to advocacy. And and I never would have thought I would have come full circle in that way. And yet here I am, right? That's like great. It, so just, cool. it just happens. Yeah. It's like nature has a way of doing it. Um, it. Personal curiosity, totally not really relevant. But you, so you said you're the old lady. You're going to bed at nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. You're making fun of her for going to bed early. Are you the one that's <laughs> staying up till one in the morning trying to get all the I'm emails sent out? In bed in my pajamas, trying to get my kid to sleep by nine fifteen. <laughs> oh, nine fifteen. Okay. So it's not very but much later. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right, so you don't have much ground to stand on here. Okay, no, but I I had that curiosity because, like, I don't, I, I don't know if you can tell I'm young. Uh, I, when I came out of high school and went into the the working world, it was, it was the boom, the beginning of the boom of entrepreneurship, and that's all I ever knew was like Gary Vaynerchuk and all these people talking about like you gotta grind super hard and work yourself into the ground and you got to have like a terrible work-life balance and I think that's like I don't know this is where we probably disagree because I think that's a crock of shit I do too yeah I am with you I'm I'm like I love the idea of going to bed early I think sleep is super important and it's just cool to hear that you guys are doing like you guys have this good work-life balance first you have an incredibly difficult job where you are you're dealing with some really difficult stuff but on top of that, you're overcoming that, becoming incredibly productive, well, on top of overcoming your own personal struggles and all of that while you're also maintaining a good, healthy balance in your own life when it comes to going to bed, eating, that type of stuff. The important I mean, things that I think people my age are maybe skipping. Do. Right. Well, and it, it is... It, and again, it's not always perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can work on work-life balance. Absolutely. I and am so busy all, all the, the time. time. So, and that's, that's where me and Destiny can also be there for each other as far as being supportive, right? Um, I was not like this for a while. I was, I'm so passionate about what we do that I was happy to answer an email at 9 p.m. I was happy to answer a call on my lunch break. I wasn't taking a lunch break because I, I just, I'm happy to help everybody and anybody. And then I, it really got to the point where I was breaking. Like at the yeah. end of the day, I was just, I was in tears um, for no reason other than I, I couldn't maintain. I just... I was giving everything Too that I had output. and there was right. I wasn't pouring yeah. anything into my own cup and I, I was just depleted. Um, so it's really important for us to keep our boundaries, right? Like when it's my lunch, I, I shut the computer. I work remotely from home. I step away from my computer. I go into my kitchen. I go for a walk and my mental health has felt so like my brain feels so much better. It just, I am so much more capable of giving to others when I take care of myself first. And 
again, a cliche, everybody knows that to be true, but it's not something we're all living. <laughs> we hear that, but nobody actually does it. I mean, it, and I'll mess up. I accidentally answered an email at 9.50 last night. It happened. Accidentally? <laughs> your email is not connected I to know, your phone. You opened up your phone <laughs> accidentally? It happened, yeah. Uh, it happened. And, but, holding each other I got, accountable. I got, got crap for that recently. I, I, my boss was like, why did you respond to my message at 10.30? Because like, I heard a ding. Uh, yeah, that's what happened. <laughs> I, I just and I needed to be productive right. at that time. Well, and it, especially when we... Are, and I don't know how old you are, but I mean, I, I'm very excited to work, right? So it doesn't, yeah, Destiny keeps telling me, hey, take take some time off. And I'm like, to do what? Like, <laughs> nothing. I'm like, I do nothing. I like working. So it's, it's, it's something that I think is super important for everybody. And I think it's also important to come home and talk about your day, not necessarily continue to talk about work. We've had to set boundaries with each other that, hey, we're not talking about work right now. We're going to talk about some silly movie or something we saw in the newspaper. TikTok. TikTok, that's that's one. That'll work out. <laughs> just something that silly. might break you in a different direction. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's Whole a new thing. bag of words. We're, we're just gonna leave that yeah. alone though. <laughs> Listen, I've gotten rid of a lot of my vices. I'm gonna leave that one right where it is. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> but no, I really, I truly agree. I think it's like more balance equals more happy equals more productive. Right. Like if yeah. you if you can be a more whole holistic individual on your in your own right, then through that you end up experiencing more productivity in your work life, more productivity in your social life, like everything, all these wins. I, I, I like am thinking, I don't know how true it is, but I like to think that I'm in my, like I'm going into my phase of balance and finding like balance <laughs> with things and realizing like how valuable it is. Yeah. Well, just to play devil's advocate, because I will. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, it. whether you yeah, want to hear it or I not. It. I love I it. Do it. <laughs> no, the, there is something I, I would like to say on this. I don't find work, the work-life balance and whatnot, because to me, where I get solace in my mental, you know, peace is that I am outworking everybody. And this is something that I, uh, I grew up, I made it to professional baseball. It was not because I was the most talented, not even remotely close, okay? It was because <laughs> I had to be dragged out of batting cages and weight rooms by my coaches. That's true on several occasions because they thought I was going to hurt myself, okay? Like, <laughs> Topher, you need a timeout, sir. Yes, I need to get, you need to go. Little buddy, you go over there. Your hands are go bleeding. Go to the corner. Time to, time to go home. Um, but I, I think there is different strokes for different different folks type yeah. of thing, you know? Um, like I said, uh, working hard and working towards a goal and always having that drive. I have to be striving towards something, and I have to have the pressure or I feel lost. So... I think it's more important that you find what the balance what works is for you. For you. Right. Yeah, that's and fair. and how you navigate these things. Healthy yeah. balance might be different for everyone. It might be nine o'clock for some and nine fifteen for others. Right. That's I mean, true. and and growth and comfort <laughs> don't live together. So no, you got to be a little bit fair. uncomfortable, right? right? Very fair. Yeah. Well, and I think finding what works for you too. That's kind of what this whole life is about, right? What works for you? What makes you happy? What allows you to do what you want to do in your day without it hurting some other area of your life? Um, I mean it it required me getting like a recovery coach so that I could continue to set goals. I think especially with recovery, um, what recovery looks like to me is complete abstinence, right? At a certain place in my recovery, I kind of got stagnant. I, I mean, I had a great job, I was managing, everything was hunky-dory, um, but it, it felt like I just plateaued. Right. And the one thing I never want to happen is for me to get stagnant, for me to get lazy. Um, so it was important to me to be able to keep setting goals keep moving that mile marker out, attain it, and then move on to the next one so that I don't ever get to a place where I'm just just chilling and, and getting lazy. And uh, that's kind of when the pitfalls happen, and that's kind of the scariest thing for me is just getting lazy. That's, that's that, mine too. Right? That's mine. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and to, to make like a, an analogy for, for folks who, who might be familiar with it, like when you, if you're, in a, if you're incarcerated, if you ever end up incarcerated, the one thing that you don't want to do is just sit on the, what they call the block, right? You just sit in your cell and you do nothing. That's where you get all the bad influences. You have all the time to make all the bad decisions. And it's the same thing when you are not in prison. It's the same thing with your own freedom. You have to treat it the same way. Like you have to get out, find ways to spend your time productively so that you're not making bad decisions right. and so that right. you're not ending up just kind of twiddling your thumbs until you find something that is negatively impactful for right. you. Yeah. And it's so easy for things to become negatively impactful. I mean, I literally will sit at home and crochet and that makes me happy. Yep. Um, it, it doesn't have Do to I get be... a blanket soon? 
probably maybe. <laughs> That's a lot of work, but yes. I a mean, blanket's a big one. It's, it's you huge. might want to start with it. Like what about a hat? A a okay, I can do that. Yeah, there we go. There I can do a little go. stuffed animals. <laughs> yeah. But part of that for me is that I, I do have a lot of ADD and a lot of anxiety. So being able to do something with my hands is incredibly helpful. Plus, you look at it and you're proud of yourself. I'm like, I made that. I made a little stuffed animal. Yeah. Look at me go. Um, but it, it's different for everybody, right? Whether you like going on hikes, whether you like reading, figure out what what gives you that little bit of peace and it may not make you super happy at the beginning it may be something learned like i started to learn how to get better at it and then it started to feel like an accomplishment and a success it wasn't at first i was like this is stupid um <laughs> but the more i started to do it and get better at it the the more um you know it, it felt beneficial to my mind and i was super proud of myself and like a little kid look what i made <laughs> i think the more productive you are the more opportunities come yes yes the more you show up even if you're frightened or scared or terrified opportunities will come if you just keep keep showing up it's like that phrase like like people say oh like he didn't he didn't get lucky he just worked hard well it's like you you worked to find you kept working hard and that's why the luck came to you Mm -hmm. like that's where the opportunities find find you is when you're putting yourself out there when you're trying to progress yourself when you're putting yourself in uncomfortable situations then you find the luck yeah i was given this great opportunity but i worked my but off yep. the whole entire time that got me up to this position that I'm in now. Yeah, exactly. Um, taking a quick step back, I'm curious your thoughts on, so you guys are helping people at the, the end, hopefully the end of their experience with the justice system, right? They've gone through all this crap and now they're at the end, they wanna be done with it, they want it off their record. What, and we touched on this briefly when we just said, and maybe this is too big of a can of worms, so tell me if it is. <laughs> That's, there's no such thing. But <laughs> what can we, what things can we do to improve this whole, like everything that happens before you guys step in? Can I step in? Because this yeah. is actually my okay. question to yeah. you. Okay, so here's what, here's what I'm hearing, okay? We have, in order, the, kind of the, process of, of recovery and everything, it starts with a rock bottom, right? That's kind of where, where we have to start the process. And then we move to the, the criminal justice system, which obviously has its, its own faults and whatnot. But it sounds to me like um, it's the, it would be like the Odyssey House would come next, right? But it sounds like we're a lot of success and then the long-term success comes in like the follow, the follow through programs. The stuff that would be after Odyssey House into then seeing coming and seeing you guys yeah well i think everybody's recovery can look different some people go through treatment-based recovery some people don't um so everybody i want to just recognize that everybody's path may be different sure as long as you remain crime free then you can get up to the expungement point you look like you're thinking it hurts yeah also 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 alphabet soup my brain is also alphabet soup um it, it, it just highlights for me. So we go to UCERA every single Thursday and do a fingerprinting clinic. I never realized how incredible UCERA, USARA is. Um, when I was first getting into detox, you know, two years ago almost, I went up to the University of Utah and I got on the bridge program and a representative from USERA came up and introduced themselves to me and said, hey, this is what we do. We're a community resource center. We have groups, we have support, we have advocates, and then you know, a year later, I'm showing up there every single week and, and making that connection. Um, they have free recovery coach, right? They have free services. So if you show up, if you call, there are resources available and they will meet you where they're at, right? Or where you're at rather. So if that's the, mar- the marijuana maintenance plan, right? If you are a person who can have a drink occasionally, whatever recovery looks like for you, recovery gets to be defined by you. Um, it doesn't have to be one specific thing. That's why I mentioned what recovery looks like for me is total abstinence. That may not be the case for other people. I know that I'm not capable of, of having a drink. That's not something that I'm able to do. Um, but I, what I really love about you, Sarah, is that they will actually show up for you. They will help you advocate and they will never charge for their services and they will always be there. There's all sorts of resources. I mean, their yeah. coaches, their classes, family nights, I mean, where you show up and sit on a beanbag and eat treats with your family. And what they like to say is you want to build your recovery capital, right? So you want to build, you want to build a life you don't want to destroy. So in the process of becoming sober, you want to build your network of people. You want to build getting an apartment, getting a good job and getting a 
a car and you just want to build things into your recovery capital that that when something is thrown your way you have the tools to deal with that and not go back out right so i guess maybe to to piggyback off of that as an interested like state employee um (laughs) do you think do you think the solutions (laughs) it is a loaded question do you think the solutions for our issues in criminal justice and and kind of all of the issues that stem from that do you think the solutions come from the government in the end do you think they're going to come from volunteerism do you think it's a combination what is it i think it could be a combination but i think it's going to be the advocates right i mean i think we need to quit overly charging people right and i'm a real big firm believer that once you've done your time and you've remained crime free for a certain amount of time those things should never be an issue for you again yeah you, it should not be a life sentence. A criminal record should not be a life sentence. Yeah. But it's going to take a lot of people like us to advocate for that because I'll tell you now, when I'm up on the Hill testifying each legislative session, I'm like the only one. Yeah. I walk in the room and they're like, oh man, here comes Miss Garcia again. <laughs> but we need more people who will go up there and share their stories and advocate for bills that are going to affect them because most people don't. So we need people who have been touched by or Mm -hmm. or just seen and are interested in helping advocate for people in these circumstances to show up yeah because the legislators are making these laws that are going to affect us not knowing how it's going to affect us so when i was working in the mayor's office i made sure to push myself to sit at those tables somebody who's directly impacted should always be sitting at the tables discussing the bills that are going to be affecting us the problem is a lot of people don't know how to do that they don't know how to get up there they don't know how to advocate and so i think it's really educating our community on how to do that how to advocate and then how to um advocate in a proper way of course right and what they're comfortable with but the legislators need to hear us um about the laws that are going to affect us right yeah and they hear from me all the time i i think it's really good i i i that was the answer i was hoping for because i really want people to believe that they can m- make a change that they can be a part of effective change right. and and it does the systems are there they're they're waiting for you to show up and mm-hmm. to be a part of it. And if you if you don't, everything you're complaining about is going to continue to be exactly the same. Right. Unless the, you're showing up. That's one of the big things we do at Clean Slate Utah is teach people how to advocate and bring them up there with us. So when the HB 392, the government fee waiver bill was going right. to sunset, we had probably 45 people up there from the Odyssey House CEO to Steps Recovery CEO to different people have gone through the expungement program who took advantage of the bill. Unfortunately, both bills got pulled right before it was heard. But I don't think that they knew what to do with that room full of people because it's never happened before. We showed up in So watch us coming. We're coming back. It's good. I love it. (laughs) That's really cool. Yeah. No, I I think it probably comes to, you know, it's it's a combination of everything. Mm -hmm. You got to do it from private. You got to do it from the legislative because the legislative, that's where the, the money comes from. Yeah. Right. And these programs need funding. They need to be bolstered. They need to be advertised properly. You know, mm-hmm. it's kind of sad that these kind of programs do exist, but your average person that is in need of this, how are they going to find out about it? And I think we have great legislators who really believe in the bills that they're running, but they're also not educated on the process of what it looks like and what the complexity might be for a normal individual who's doing it. Right. That, that's like a, that, that's such a perfect kind of just overall encapsul- encapsulation of legislators as a whole, right? Mm-hmm. Like legislators are not experts in, in anything, but legislatoring. Right. Like <laughs> they, they need to be listening to people who have the expertise, who have the knowledge, who have the lived experience to understand how this is going to impact people and how they, what, what, they can do to actually affect the change that needs to happen yeah we need to educate them yeah we have a lot of good legislators it happens on both sides it happens on with this i don't know you probably have experience with this too it happens with state agencies Mm -hmm. right state agencies have to do the same thing with the legislature that the public has to do the state agency has to say like hey we you know if they don't communicate anything nothing changes the state agency stays just as shitty as it's always been if they if they're talking about these are the things that we need these are the resources we need these are the roadblocks that we're coming up against the legislature is there to help but if they don't communicate that 
nothing changes. Correct. And it's the, it's the same, it's, a, it's definitely a two-way street in that way. The public has the same opportunity to do that with the legislature that state agencies do. They just don't realize it. Yeah, I yeah. think that goes all the way up to Congress as well. Yeah, sure. well, I testified uh, for Congress for the Clean Slate Act and the Fresh Start Act. And then when I was in DC, Congresswoman uh, Rochester was up there who has a great knowledge about the criminal records and the expungement process and the clean slate law. But it's not very often you see a legislator talk in that detail and understand because right. they just don't know. Yeah. Huh. So I showed up with Destiny, I think it was to a CJAC meeting and just hearing- Criminal Justice Advisory Council meeting. And just hearing individuals for. have conversations about how homelessness affects individuals but never having lived that. It is so important that people who are willing to share their experience will, will show up and tell you, hey, that's actually not relevant. When you're living on the streets, it is not relevant whether or not you can get certain resources. There are certain things that are very important, um, but from, I don't wanna say from a pedestal, but from a different angle, how, how could you possibly see what is actually relevant when you don't have a place to go? So right. it's super important that people who are open about their story and proud of where they've come from, that will show up and tell you where they've come from this is what i experienced right. um, and it, it's just so cool to see when people are having those conversations about a population you have been a part of when you can actually show up and be like, like actually i was there and this is what was relevant to me and most of those meetings are put on the utah public notice website and are open to the public and take public comment but the public don't know that yep. yeah That's where do you find problem. out about that <laughs> unless you have somebody like me who knows who's worked in government for years before they took over this organization. I know those things because I posted the, the things on the government website, um, but most people don't know that. Like you can attend, you can become members of these boards as a public citizen, you know, yeah. and most people don't know that yep. and have an input on what's gonna be happening with the Salt Lake County laws and with our legislators and the laws coming up. Right, yeah, it, 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 share your stories, but then also, I like that you guys were talking about how you are also uh, teaching people or trying to kind of lead people towards advocating effectively because you can do just as much damage advocating in ineffective ways or, or in ways that, you know, like if you, if you show, there's a time to be passionate about things, mm -hmm. but if you're showing up and really you're just being kind of a child about it, it's not, the, the impact is negative. And you only get two minutes anyway. Exactly. So we help people with some talking points like talk about this, talk about this, talk about this, be done. Right. And if you need help mapping that out, we'll help you map that out. Take your paper up there and read it word for word if you have to right. to get your point across so that you have, you have make an impact within that two minutes. Right. Hmm. It's the marketing and sales thing. Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's, the elevator it's, pitch. it's the elevator pitch. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, and people need to be taught that. That's a skill that is, mm -hmm. that is taught. Very much so. And I think the bottom line too is that our justice system, we can all attest that some portions of it are very broken, right? At the end of the day, we're, we're more focused on solutions. I wanna help people yep. get through this process and get to the other side. Of course, there's always going to be monumental issues. There's always gonna be injustice. At the end of the day though, let's figure out what we can do to get you beyond that, to get you through this process so that you no longer have to deal with that. The system's never going to be perfect. It certainly is nowhere near. But for me, focusing on the negatives is not going to help me succeed and help other people succeed and i'm out here advocating asking for money trying to change laws meeting with all the the top people trying to get things better for our organization well and you guys are a perfect illustration of this broken system is full of people that want to help yeah. yes. yes like as, as much as the system as much as we can sit here and and complain about how poor the system is functioning and it is in some regards but if we don't endorse it, if we don't believe in it, and if we don't try to make it better, then what are we, what are we let's, doing? Let's be fair about something real quick. You know, if you go back through all of human history, right? In the United States, we have our problems. We really do. But if we're talking about a legal what? system, we did? perfect. <laughs> well, <laughs> but I'm was, saying, be easy on it. By the same token, we do have the ability to, there are places to go and make changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. This isn't some oligarchy that, that you have no say whatsoever and somebody from the top down is going right. to 100% mandate this. Yeah. It, it is still the United States. We still, yes, it's there's problems, but we, we there are pathways to making this stuff work. Yeah. Well, and I yeah. feel I think comfortable. the power comes in numbers. Yeah. 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 And I feel comfortable and confident advocating for myself, whereas that would not be the case in other in other countries and other situations where you would actually have to fear for your safety if you were to verbalize your opinion. Whereas here, we can advocate, we can move forward in 
in, in productive manners, but you're right. In other places, that wouldn't even be an option, and it would be quite scary to, to make that standard, to make that statement, and hear that it's not the case, and there's a way to continue to modify that to make it even more impactful and use it in the right places and the right ways. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm super, super grateful that we do have a pathway prior to this law going through. It was there, but it was very hard to get through, and I think even as an organization, we're we're more focused on the positive, right? At the end of the day, there is a way to get through this. We now have part in support. We can help support you through the expungement. Um, and we are your biggest, you know, cheerleader. I will, you know, give you a high five when you get through this next step. I will write you an email just saying, hey, congrats, this is a really big deal. I'm, I'm really proud that you're you're making it through this because that's all it takes is just knowing that you have support. Yep. And it, it's just not, it's not productive to focus on the negative. It really just, it's not. The only way you're gonna move forward is if you see the, the positive in everything, no matter how dark it is. If you can find one thing that is positive or at least a neutral, you're, you're gonna make much more progress than if you just focus on the doom and gloom and all the things that are broken, right? I think expungement is becoming a movement. 10 years ago, nobody was talking about expungement. Five years ago, nobody was right. talking about expungement. Right. Right. And now everybody's talking about yeah. expungement. There's laws around expungement. People are getting access to expungement. And the pro and it's been there all along. Yep. So now it's, I think it's becoming a movement nationwide, and I think it's going to uh, help our economy for one. So yeah, like, for sure. I mean, I went from living on government assistance, being on Section 8 housing, having Medicaid, having food stamps to uh, being a homeowner. I own my own home today and I don't have any government benefits. Yep. But I'll tell you when I came on the housing list and I was working at the mayor's office and they're like, you're up off for housing. I'm like, oh man, do I quit the, the mayor's office and take the housing <laughs> or do I keep the mayor's office and leave the housing? Like, what, what am I gonna do? And right. what I've always known is government assistance. And yep. that's what I wanted to do, but I did something different. And thank God I did something different because now my whole life looks different. Hmm. So it's like, now that expungement is on everybody's forefront, I hope that it will help our economy become better. Yeah, and I will tell you just as an individual, this past year was the first time I have paid taxes in probably a decade, and I was, I mean, not super happy to do my taxes because yeah. I was very overwhelmed. That's a whole and different I, story. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but at the bottom line is that I am now a contributing member to society. I'm contributing to our economy. I did, I'm paying my taxes. I'm a good neighbor. Um, it, it really opens up so many different pathways, and I can now be the, the neighbor, the human, the American that I've always wanted to be, and I've never been able to get there. I am now beginning to be that person that I, I would hope anybody would want to live to, live next to, and who I want to live next to. Yeah, I have an adult son that's just turned 24. And then I have a toddler that's four. My toddler has a college savings fund today. My adult son never got any of those things. He's yeah. putting himself through college. Right. He, we didn't have an extra dollar to give him. So expungement changes people's lives, but it also changes their it changes their children's lives and their it's children's the children's lives. It's the same spider web, yeah. web effect. Right? Yep. For sure. It, it's going to continue on generationally at that mm -hmm. point. Unfortunately, the criminal behavior can be learned behavior too, right? Because it, yep. it has been successful. Um, and, and it. <laughs> I mean, depending on how, it, it just, <laughs> all of these things are learned behaviors, right? Yeah. Whether it was just something that um, you couldn't get away with, you couldn't afford, just some way that you had to maintain to keep surviving, um, it still is a learned behavior that can be adjusted, that can be modified, but you almost have to replace it with something more beneficial, right? Um, and for me, the feeling of earning my paycheck, being able to buy a vehicle, being able to pay my taxes, that for me is more empowering and makes me happier than when I would get that rush of dopamine from stealing. And that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. But for me now, saving money and seeing seeing what I'm able to start accomplishing for myself and my future goals, that gives me almost the same dopamine adrenaline rush that I used to get from doing things that were very illegal and were going to get me in, in trouble or in a situation that was very dangerous. And when we have that one client reach out and say, you changed my life, you know? Yeah. That's a great feeling, man. And it, it's it's so cool because people are being really vocal about their gratitude for our help, and I didn't really expect that. I started showing Destiny the emails I was getting, and I was like, this is what I'm seeing on a daily basis. People saying, hey, I've made it all the way through the progress or the, through the process, and I'm so happy I had help. I made it. Um, it, it it's so so cool to see because everybody's life that goes through this process their life has dramatically shifted from what it used to be and this this survival mentality of just hoping they don't check your background or hoping you can you know sneak by hr whatever the case may be where now you just get to be unapologetically you and there's lots of times you go to get a service and you don't reach back out to that service right and you don't say oh hey your service is great but when you're so excited because your whole life is going to change these people are reaching out on a daily basis and saying thank you you know that's incredible. One yeah. of the, that's one of the hardest parts about corrections is 
people, the only people that we see after they are, after we're done with them is if they come back, right? We're not seeing the successes. We're not hearing the thank you for changing my life. Thank you for, and, and we know what happens. I mean, we statistically, we can look at it and see exactly how much of it is happening, but it, it's, it's really important for people to recognize the help that they've gotten along the way too, so that that continues, I think. And whether that's participating in it themselves, whether that's just reaching out to the person that helped them and saying thank you, or saying, no, you don't even have to thank them, just being like, hey man, this is where I'm at now. Yeah. Like that could be the biggest reward for that person, where it's like, not thanks for getting me here, you did everything for me, but like, hey, look where I am. Like, For I'm sure. pretty proud of me. I yeah. really think that our clients at, at the end, at the very end, they're like, you're my friend. Like, you've yeah. helped me through the whole process. Right. They People come in to get our fingerprint clinic, um, and they're they're like friends with us already, you know, because we right. have a, an agreement with BCI that we can do fingerprints. So instead of sending them over to BCI to get the fingerprints done, they come to USARA to get such it done. A better, that's such a better way to do it. That's yeah. a problem. And they come in, and we have donuts, and we talk to them. We share some of our stories. They leave being donuts. our friends. That's what I need to do. Yeah, I mean, it, we get really yummy donuts. But Delis and donuts <laughs> yeah. on I mean, I the wake, best. I wake Wait, up what is it? Deli and donuts. Deli and donuts. 2700 South and State Street. The best donut yeah, you will ever have. I mean, I no, I wake up in the morning on Thursday, and I'm just ready for donuts. Um, it's tomorrow's out. Thursday. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm aware. So part of it, too, if, so if you were to have a warrant, say you had a warrant that you were unaware of, say you had a traffic warrant from, from Clearfield or some city that's 45 minutes away, and you were just oblivious. It, it is absolutely possible. You went into BCI to start this process, and you had a warrant. You could get arrested Literally right in that moment and yeah. have no idea. So even just the intimidation factor of walking into a government facility, being fingerprinted by an officer, um, it, it just can be unpleasant. A lot of us have some trauma from arrests, whether they were warranted or not. That does cause trauma. That causes intimidation. So if we can provide an environment where we're just hanging out, we're just, you know, we're going to hang out. We're going to have a conversation, share some food, share some coffee. And, resources. And then, yeah. There's tons of resources at USARA. So yeah. people often leave with more resources than what they came in with. For yeah. sure. Sorry, sure. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're great. I've been doing good about that in this I know. We've been doing setting. good. I know. I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so one of the, the coolest things I've noticed, too, is my I have, because I am a house manager, I have a roommate that lives with me, um, and she is off parole for the first time in 20 years. For the first time in 20 years. And it's wow. one of those examples of when you surround yourself with people who are doing good in their life, who are striving to change who they have been in the past, it, it is absolutely monumental to see what people can accomplish when they take all of this energy that was devoted to the hustle, to getting your drugs, to getting to getting this this to getting through the day, right? When when you use that in a productive, constructive manner, it, it is just so cool to see how dramatically individuals can change in a short period of time because you have this energy and you have this. It's like a superpower. It you is have a superpower. Absolutely. You just need to hone it. And everybody does, right? Yeah. It's just a matter of figuring out what yours is and how you can use it. And I, yeah. it's just, it's so cool to watch people come through any of these processes, whether it's recovery, whether it's, you know, homelessness, whether it's the expungement process, when you actually get to the end of something and you've accomplished something for yourself, it, it changes the way people carry themselves. They have yeah. a light about them. They're proud of themselves. Their shoulders are back. Their head is high. And just to see that internal change in somebody, I mean, there's, there's nothing better in the entire yeah. world. Hmm. Agreed. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm super, super blessed to have my job, which we can then put out to other people. Like Destiny has also become my mentor, one of my best friends, my boss, um, and, and in all different capacities. And we've done a really good job of being able to help support each other in our professional life, as well as help each other in our personal life. And I, I think that I am uniquely, I am in a very unique position and I am extremely grateful for that. And hopefully as we continue to move forward, we can create this culture of gratitude, right? You don't have to tell everybody that they changed your life, but just saying, hey, this, this impacted me, this made a difference and I'm, I'm happy I met you. Just making that normal to say, I think is really important because there are so many people that have an impact on your life that never know it, right? Yep. In your position, you're seeing all the bad. I mean, you're seeing yeah. the really, really hard bits of, of society and seeing people at their worst on their worst day. Exactly. It's just, it's very, very difficult to do that day in and day out. When I made it through Odyssey and I graduated, I went back to VOA Detox where I started my journey because they don't see successes. Yeah. They are seeing people literally on the worst days of their entire life coming out of abusive relationships on death's doorbed. 
and I made a point of going back and, and talking to the staff, like what you guys are doing is, it does matter. It's yeah. changing lives. And just because you guys are not seeing that, I want to tell you that it changed my life and it does work. Absolutely. It's hard as a prison to advocate for people to leave us testimonials, but <laughs> it would be good. Yeah, I could, I could see that being, being a little weird, awkward conversation yeah, happening. could be. Could like be maybe let's bit. get a little space before we ask yeah, for that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they want is space from yeah, the Department of Corrections. Exactly. Yeah. For sure, though. Right. That, that I know I, I walk – I. I have stopped walking into the grocery store with my Department of Corrections shirt on. Absolutely, yeah. I just stopped doing it because it's just like people are like, oh. Mm -hmm. That know. guy's here. Yeah, great. <laughs> Perfect. Exactly what I wanted to see on the outside. Yeah. It's like seeing your teacher when you're not in class. It's true. Damn, I don't know why. <laughs> but I mean, I would imagine for you too, it's so important to actually to celebrate the positives, right? And to celebrate when people do get out because it, even in your line of work, right? You could go down that, that rabbit hole of pessimism so easily oh, yeah. and you could just become a dick, bottom yeah. line, yeah. and just be so unhappy at your job and having to deal with people. So even just the fact that you can talk about it and you have found ways to, to find the positive and not go down that route of just hating everybody and everything is, is, is incredible too. It's really wonderful to not be that dick in a uniform. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're in jail, that's all, the, that's all they are. They're yeah. really right. mean. They hate yeah. you. Right. They're miserable people, and yeah. it sucks that that's... It's unfortunate, too, right? Because, like, a lot of people's experiences are are jail and are not not particularly, particularly good. And, and there are still, like, if you... There are still so many people who want to help, and, and like, if you get a, a case manager in prison, like, those people want to help, and all the people in programming, all they want to do is provide any resource that they possibly can to help you. But it's really hard to see the the what was it the forest for the trees in that circumstance. Like all you're seeing is people who are the man, right. and they are there to keep you here yep. and keep you in line, keep you in line until right. you release. You know, though. But again, I'm gonna push back on you just because we can. <laughs> I don't know that that's a bad thing, and I, I understand that we're. But there's other crimes of people that are in there, yes. and they're in there for a reason. Absolutely. And, and that's part of the broken system. That, that, and that's fair. That's yeah. a legitimate argument. But I would be okay with prison being as bad as it can be, okay? If the follow-up, if, follow if, <laughs> if, and somebody has to be the bad guy. That, that, right. that, that's just the nature of the, of the beast. Right. Sure. If the follow-up programs were in place to make sure that people – Almost to the point, like if you did, if prison really was that bad, right? right you're going to try really hard to never, ever, to never, never go, go back, back. Or, or to never end up there. Right? To, and, to never and maybe end up that there. where you're providing people with opportunities where they're not going to end right. up in prison in the first place. I don't and where you're not giving the guy who like sold weed once in the same set, like the same block of people as the guy who is now going to teach him how to run a criminal enterprise. <laughs> right. Or, I mean, let's, let's call it nice the, the worst that are in there are the, the child molesters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. right? There's, thank God for some prison justice that, that does right. take place. On the, well, the um, nonviolent drug offenders are spending more time in prison than the child molesters. And that's, right. a, problem. that's a problem. Right. And that's a problem. That's a whole other conspiracy that I think is is coming to the forefront is on a national scale right now yep. that, that you're seeing and that I'm the war against a, drugs. Yeah. Guess what? It didn't work. Drugs won. Drugs right. drugs didn't win. Epic fail. <laughs> so I, I will. So when I first started doing this, we were setting up people's Rasa accounts before I hopped on a Zoom with them, right? And I would kind of see what we were working with and kind of see what that conversation looked like, especially when we were just learning what these conversations were going to be. I had to stop doing that because. I would come across charges that sent my head spiraling, right? You, Forcible sodomy you charges. A of this person. Right. Automatically I have an idea of who this person is and it made it very, very difficult to have just to have a, a conversation on neutral playing field. Um, there are people who are the worst of the worst and deserve to never see daylight again, right? At the end of the day, we know those people exist and it's it's horrible to think. But there's also people who have gotten charged with similar charges that did not do anything. Yeah. That's fair. And it's, mm -hmm. yeah. that's why I had to stop looking because when you see charges against a child um, that have some type of sexual aspect to them, my mind immediately was black and white and it was very hard for me to have a conversation and, and see them on camera and not feel almost anger, it, like in the pit of my heart. Like, so I stopped doing that because at the end of the day, we have no idea what actually transpired. Yep. And Whether, one of those charges were dismissed. Right. And that's in, that's the craziest situation, too. I, I helped somebody the other day that had a forcible sodomy charge that was dismissed. 
dismissed. That charge can oh. change and that, that will end yeah, your entire that, yeah. life. I yeah. mean, you would get excommunicated from your church. You would never, ever have a job ever again. And this charge was your dismissed. Your family will, like, the, the, the right. worst things oh. happen to people with those, those, those types of allegations. Yeah. Well, right. and, and, I mean, you could play the, the back and forth ping pong yeah. game until you're blue in the face. Yeah. <laughs> by, this, by the same token, you know, like how many people have gotten accused of stuff that just wasn't Amber Heard, right? Mm -hmm. You know, oh, the, yeah. and that, that happens all the time. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, and, it, and it, I think you guys are definitely familiar with this, and this is something that I've become familiar with. I, I, I've only been in this field for two years, um, but it humanizes people. Yeah. Like, when you when you do see someone who, right, I, I, I went and did a video shoot with a guy, and uh, I didn't, f and he was the nicest guy that I've ever interacted with. He was just incredibly nice the whole time wasn't until after the fact that I found out how tremendously bad his crimes were. And it was just like, oh, wow. Well, he was just a human to me. He was just, he was just a person. He just treated me like a person. Everything was totally fine. The entire interaction was totally fine. And, and it, it coming in without assumptions about people and, and realizing that people can have gone to prison, they can have been under supervision, they can have done or been said to have done some pretty horrendous shit and yet can be really good people that right. you need to give a chance to. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think it depends on what room I walk into, but I sometimes I won't lead with my story. I'll lead with my title right? and then go into my story later right? because then I get more respect. Yep. After I talk about Clean State Utah organization and then I end with my story, you'll see a huge difference in yeah. different audiences, right? Yeah, I believe that. And I wanted to say one other thing that kind of came to me earlier oh, uh, shifting back to the topic of the kind of political advocacy like i think that what you guys are doing and and what we're describing here tonight this is political action we yes. haven't talked about our political views almost at all right only the things that are relevant to the, the topic that we're talking about we're really only talking about things that we understand that that we can say with pretty good with a pretty good confidence level that that are true and we're not we're not getting down on one another for anything it's just like you guys have been impacted by something i'm involved in something and we're trying to find ways to to improve upon it and i think that's what political action should look like we it's have the devil advocate over here yeah <laughs> well it should, but i mean to be to be but fair yeah, yeah. I, but it's still respectful conversation yeah yeah okay, i think right. like devil's advocate is great yeah. I, i'm all for devil's advocate. <laughs> like like poke holes in my opinions right. poke holes in my thoughts mm -hmm. but like let's not get into shouting matches yeah. so let's not another. let's not stand on ceremony he's the master we're we're, we're sitting in reverse <laughs> chairs yeah. right now oh, man. <laughs> That's I'm, always I'm actually that. trying to poke him. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the whole part of, like, if you're going to have an opinion, I, I, I would love to hear how you got to that point, right? Please yes. tell teach me you. how you yes. got there. Yes. And teach everyone. me something new. For sure. I would love to hear what you know that I don't know. That helps us improve yes. and be better humans. And at the end of the day, we're just passionate about what we do and who we help. It has nothing to do with, with anything political. I mean, obviously, there are certain aspects of it, but we're just people trying to help other people. It's per perspectives. Like, yeah. political opinions come from lived experiences right. most of the time. Perspective comes from lived experiences. Right. Tell me right. what happened. Tell me... <laughs> Like, who hurt you? But no, like tell me. <laughs> <laughs> like, but no, like tell me what your circumstance is. Maybe you have lived a completely different life than me, and and I just don't understand where you're coming from. But if I could, if I could have you yeah. explain it to me, then I would understand. Yeah. And I can then I can empathize with that, and then I can say, oh yeah, you know what? Actually, I agree with that. We can agree on this. Let's work on that together. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And especially learning somebody's history, if you have. It, it's just so cool to get more layers of somebody, right? If you have an opinion, then you stick to that opinion. But when I ask you more about it, you're like, well, because I said so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> There's a point where I'll, I go, okay. I'm going to walk that way. It's like we're not having a conversation right. anymore. What's but, weird is how much time we've spent searching for those people. Yeah. Oh, for <laughs> sure. And, and not a joke. Him oh. and I will go back and forth. And Scott. Scott's up there, too. Uh, we'll go back and forth for days on this just to try to poke each other until it 
until <laughs> somebody gets a reaction out of it, you know. I love that. And and that, but that is how we come to better conclusions. With yes. Things. Right. You know, that's how you actually how you actually resolve things. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have, if you don't surround yourself with different opinions. Absolutely. Right. How are you going to know if your opinion is good or not? Yeah. And then you're going down that confirmation bias rabbit hole, and everything you see, you know, just adds yep. to what your belief is. It it, it just gets real and bad. And that's what people think political action looks like. Right. Absolutely. Which is terrifying. Right. And, <laughs> And just digging their heels in and just getting even more firm on your stance. And that's really, yeah. yeah, I agree. It's so cool to have conversations about all facets of things, whether it's touchy subjects or not. I mean, we've talked about uh, substance misuse disorder. We've talked about homelessness. We've talked about, you know, criminal charges and prison and jail and, and things that are really unpleasant to talk about, but they don't have to be, right? Yep. You exactly. can actually have conversations that are helpful and, and encouraging and positive. Yeah, productive conversations. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's how we move things forward. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Well, guys, I think that's a good good place to wrap <laughs> things up for one great. night. Yeah. Uh, thank you so wow. much for for uh, coming on. Well, well, I, did it. I knew oh, we were, I knew yeah. we were going to be talkers. I had a strong me. Yeah, we yeah. do this all day. <laughs> well, you, t- you, I come in and you're like you're you're the first seat. So. I'm the I'm the matchmaker, man. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well it's played, like I sir. didn't even do any research, and then you're like, oh well, it's a criminal. Jo- oh. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, Done. Sense. Done. <laughs> no, thank you for having us on. Yeah. No, it we really appreciate it, and uh, um, I would like to keep both of you guys' numbers, and, yes, and we will. Uh, stuff comes up. We have different people come in. I think mm-hmm. you guys bring a very unique vantage point, and uh, I would love to have you back on. Yeah, maybe with after that. we have a new bill, this next legislative say, session, you change, can have us back. I yes, think that yeah. we're going to have new stuff to talk yeah, about. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I'm super grateful we came, and I also appreciate that you guys are further in conversations, especially between men, especially between groups of people that don't necessarily talk about all of the things. So yeah. I'm, I'm super grateful you guys have created this and that you allowed us to be a part of this. So we had you. fun. Thank this you. was fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. It was yeah. fun. Yeah. Awesome. It's a good My Wednesday pleasure. night for us, for sure. <laughs> and then donuts tomorrow. And donuts I, tomorrow. tomorrow. We're just getting all the First wins. thing in the morning. I know. I'll <laughs> eat three by like 10 a.m. It's perfect. So you can text us and say thank you for the donut. <laughs> <laughs> I will deal. be visiting. What, what yeah. was it again? Donuts in Delhi, 2700 South State Street. They do sell out by like 10 a.m. So That's you okay. got you got to show up. I'll be over there. Yep. I mean, they like melt. They're like still warm. Yeah, they're yeah. so good. It's... You can eat like six of those bad boys. <laughs> I'm glad I worked out so, so light. hard tonight, and now I know why. See, perfect. <laughs> you, knew, you knew there was a reason. Awesome. Uh, All right, guys. Sweet. And break. Thank you so much. Thank you guys.